So we're going to be talking about Brexit, um, European ter turmoil that it has created, um, and particularly what the Bible says about this, because hopefully you'll learn tonight um, that it actually has quite a great deal to say. Now, I wanted to start off by saying that you could be quite forgiven for feeling like the man in seat 123, because Brexit has been on the news for at least three weeks now, um, and it had been on the news a lot even before it happened, um, and you're probably I'm sick to death of hearing about it and hearing people at work complain about it or extol its virtues, whichever way. So if you are feeling a bit bored of Brexit, um, don't fear, because hopefully tonight we're going to take a, a pretty fresh perspective and quite a different look at it, maybe one that you haven't considered in a much depth before. So before we really get stuck in, I thought it's probably worthwhile um, just looking at what we're actually going to cover tonight, so you have a bit of an overview of the journey we're going on. Um, in case you haven't already read every single article about Brexit, which I think I have, on BBC at least, we're going to do a quick overview, and that includes looking at who the key players are, um, and looking at the global reaction, and maybe a few potential implications of what the vote actually means. Then we're going to very briefly touch on why we think Bible students weren't quite as surprised as the rest of the world when this actually happened. And we're going to particularly spend a good part of our evening looking at one really interesting Bible prophecy, which we believe um, explains why we weren't surprised that Brexit happens. And indeed, it also gives us some very encouraging hope for the future. And finally, we're going to walk away um, with a personal challenge for you to take home and consider a, a nice, simple thing for you to go home and do if you have found tonight interesting and or compelling. So let's get stuck into our outline of Brexit. Now it's probably fair to say that not many people saw this coming. You know something's a surprise if the bookies weren't expecting it, and they certainly weren't. So to them it, it came as a big surprise. But hopefully what we can show tonight is that not everybody was actually confu um, surprised by Brexit. In fact, many people were actually expecting it. And, and in our own community of Bible students, we've, we've had people expecting an event like this for over a hundred years, if not more. So how we know that, we'll come to a bit later on. I thought I'd start off with um, a quick outline of the key players. Now what's amusing is that I was unusually prepared for this um, talk and I actually did my, finish my slides last night. And when I woke up in the morning, I discovered that they were wrong. They were out of date. Because last night when I put the slides together, the man on the screen was technically still the British Prime Minister. But when I woke up this morning, he wasn't anymore and now Theresa May is the new British Prime Minister. But David Cameron still played a very key role in Brexit. Um, and we're going to touch a little bit more on him in a moment. But he was, he was a, a key campaigner for Remain. He really wanted, um, he believed in the EU and he wanted them to stay in the European Union. Now, the man with the famous haircut, or lack thereof, Boris Johnson, he was the former Mayor of London. Now, this is really interesting because um, Boris and David were actually really good friends. They went to university together. Um, they were in the same boys club and, and they described themselves as best friends. And they remained best friends right up until the moment that, that Boris sent David a last minute text message. So it's not just the young generation. He sent him a last minute text message saying, by the way, Dave, I'm going to join the Leave team. See you in the morning. And then he announced the next day that he was um, going to head up the Leave campaign. Now that caused quite a rift between them. Um, and David Cameron actually publicly said, we're still friends, but it's pretty rocky. And we're certainly not best friends. <coughs> now, you couldn't, of course, have followed the Brexit turmoil without coming across um, this rather interesting character, Nigel Farage. Now, he also has gone. He was the former member of what's called the UK Independence Party. He's probably best known for a photograph of himself standing in front of a big poster that he created, which really echoed um, a similar um, propaganda that came out in the time of the Nazis. So he was really anti-immigration. He was in the EU Parliament for 17 years, and his stated aim that entire time was to get Britain out of Europe. And what was quite astonishing is that at the pinnacle or the zenith of his political career, when he got them out of Europe, he resigned. He said, I'm done. I'm happy. I'm finished. I'm going to spend some time with the family. So, so those are the, um, the key players. And obviously, there's many, many others. Um, and indeed, their roles have changed. I mean, Boris Johnson was trying to be the prime minister. And he actually ended up throwing in the towel for that particular race. But when I woke up this morning, I found out to my shock and amusement that he's now the foreign minister of the UK.
So there's some big moves happening and, and some quite funny ones. And uh, in fact, we'll touch on it a bit later. But when um, the, the, his appointment as the foreign minister got announced, the US, I can't remember what his name was, but the, the secretary, the press secretary guy who, who heard the news actually had to stifle a laugh before he responded and, and made up a, um, a little bit about how excited he was that they could work together. But it was quite a shock for everyone, not just me, when I woke up this morning. The question is, how did we get here? Why did Brexit even happen? Now, we could probably spend a whole night on this, and to your relief, we're not going to do that. Um, but here's a quick overview. The European Union has existed, um, has got quite a long and colourful history, and it's existed under um, a number of different names. And it really first came into being after World War II, um, and probably its earliest or most common form was called the European Economic Community, or the EEC. Now that was formed in 1957 and it was European nations who got together. Now Britain tried to join four years later, in 1961, but a certain character called Charles de Gaulle decided that he didn't want any Brits at his French party, so he said no, and he vetoed their attempt to get in. Now, for, fortunately for Britain, Charles de Gaulle didn't remain around forever, and he eventually um, moved off the political scene. And as soon as he did, the UK applied to get into the European economic community once again, and they joined in 1973. Now there's a very interesting fact which I think has been overlooked in the papers in this whole Brexit thing, and that is that they joined in 73, but only two years later they held a referendum to decide whether they wanted to actually stay in the European Economic Community. Now, so that was in 1975. Now, they actually, the Remain vote won by 67%, which is a big majority. But what I think is interesting is that tells you only two years after joining, a third of the country did not want to be in the EEC already, um, which is, is quite interesting um, and hasn't really been mentioned um, in the press, not, not that I've found anyway. Now, the other thing to consider is that that referendum is the first referendum the UK ever had, the first nationwide referendum. So it was a big deal. And it remains their one and only referendum all the way up until 2011 when they held another one on a different matter. So it was obviously a pretty big deal um, and they had 65% voter turnout which is, is really quite impressive. So we fast forward to 2013 and what we find is that this whole issue of will we be in the EU or won't we has been bubbling under the surface in the UK for literally decades. And David Cameron says, that's enough. We're going to decide, we're going to make a decision. And what he did is he promised the general public that if his party won a majority vote at the 2015 general election, he said two things. Number one, we'll go to the European Union and we'll negotiate a better deal because you know, we can. And number two, we'll hold a referendum to, to settle this once and for all. Now they did win and he kept his word. And he went to the European Union and he attempted to negotiate a better deal. And very briefly, he wanted a better deal on control of immigration, which is obviously a big concern in the UK. Um, he wanted new power for national government. What that means is that if the European <coughs> Parliament sets a, a law, then there's not a lot, and this is putting it nicely, there's not a lot that the national governments can do about it. So if the European Parliament votes on something, then Belgium and France and Germany and, and Britain and everyone else pretty much has to implement that law. And, and that's, that is quite upsetting to a lot of people from the UK who want, like to think that, well, we rule our own country, but unfortunately they're really in many ways ruled from Brussels. So David Cameron wanted to change that as well. He also, and, and this is quite interesting, he also wanted the EU to abandon their notion of ever closer union. Now, what that means is what it sounds like. The EU's stated goal is to slowly over time draw everyone in as close as possible, this ever closer union. And Britain wanted them to abandon that, which is quite odd because it's almost like their stated goal of existence. And I think that's shown in the fact that Britain are geographically culturally, and tonight we will see, religiously, quite different from the rest of Europe. So they feel very uncomfortable about being forced into this ever closer union. And I think that's shown in the fact that they've not adopted the euro, they've stuck with the pound through thick and thin. So what happened after all of that? Well, David Cameron went home and there was no fundamental change to the UK-EU relationship. And what was really interesting was that 
um, in the UK, a lot of people were very upset. I read this fascinating article which basically said people thought that it just showed how arrogant Brussels was. We went there to negotiate with the threat of us leaving Europe and Brussels just went, thanks for coming, the door's over there. And, and in Brussels, um, there was an article from The Guardian and this is what it said. EU staffers were bitter and disappointed that David Cameron had failed to accept the very generous deal that had been offered to them. So what you see is these two polar opposites where the EU are like, we're offering you this great deal, you can be part of our, our community. And the UK are clearly unhappy with that. So in the end, there was no real improvement on the relationship and the referendum happened on the 23rd of June. Now because we know the result, I think perhaps we forget what happened in the days leading up. But what happened was that um, the Remain vote held a significant lead and if you were following um, the vote very early on, you may remember that Nigel Farage, um, our friendly anti-immigrant guy from earlier, he actually cast his vote and then turned around to the press and all but conceded defeat and said, look, I don't think we're going to do it, um, but we've made a great statement, we've laid the groundwork, you know, we can really go onwards and upwards from here. Now, I don't think he was fibbing because you could see over the hours that followed, because he's obviously stayed up throughout the night, over the hours that followed, his position changed and he started becoming quite astonished as what was happening um, really became clear. But what's interesting is that there's two polls I'll refer, refer you to. A Comrades poll in the final week put the Remain vote ahead by 6 to 8 per cent. So that's a pretty significant margin. The day before the vote, a Populous online poll had remained leading by 10%, 55 to 45. So that's why the bookies felt they were pretty safe with their odds of remain winning. And then to the world shock, that happened. And if you were like me, you probably didn't do a lot of work on Friday and you sat at your computer and kept clicking refresh because you couldn't quite believe your eyes. Um, I work in an office of about 100 people in our Sydney office and about 50 of them are British, so it was uh, quite a frantic time in the office. Um, not a lot happened. So in the end, leave one, 52 to 48, and there was quite, um, quite a response. So David Cameron resigned because he had promised he was going to. Um, I don't personally think he was expecting he was ever going to have to come good on that promise, um, but he, he kept to his word and resigned. The question is, how did the world react? And I've got a series of quotes from a number of different world leaders, which is quite illuminating. So Francois Hollande, who's the French president, said, this is a painful choice and deeply regrettable for both the UK and Europe. The British vote is a tough <coughs> test for Europe. So that was his view. Angela Merkel, the German chancellor, used very similar language. We take note of the British people's decision with regret. This is a blow to Europe and to the unification process or the ever closer union. Um, Barack Obama was actually quite a lot more measured in what he said, which is quite interesting, and if you can lock this thought away, um, please do. He didn't really focus on the trouble it was going to cause, he'd, he'd said that up, up, into, up to the vote. He had very strongly recommended they remain. But once they decided to leave, he didn't stand there like other world leaders and get really upset about it. He tried to reiterate the close relationship between the UK and the US. And that message was repeated this morning when they mentioned that um, Boris Johnson is going to be the Foreign Minister, which, as I said, brought about a few laughs with the US, but they still um, stuck to that line. Now, if he was measured, this chap wasn't. Manuel, I'm not really sure how to say his last name, is it Val or Vals? I don't know, I'm Kiwi. But anyway, the French Prime Minister wasn't very measured. He said, it's an explosive shock. At stake is the breakup of the state of the, um, pure and simple of the Union. Now, the last bit is amazing. He says, now is the time to invent a new Europe. And, and that's really quite, um, quite a, a big and a bold statement. You may have heard of this chap. He, he doesn't, doesn't look particularly happy in any of the photos I sourced. And I wouldn't be either if I had Russia sitting on my doorstep. And he made a quite astonishing statement. You've got to think about this one. He said, today, the most urgent challenge that the Euro, um, Euro, European Union is, is facing is finding a way to the hearts and minds of, the, of Euro skeptics. Now why is that a strange thing to say? Well if you think about it, the European Union has some massive challenges facing it. Let me list you just a few of them. They have terrorism, the migrant crisis, the failing Euro, 
or feeble and collapsing economies like Greece and Italy. They're all pretty major problems. And Petro says the biggest problem are Eurosceptics, people who don't believe in the union. But what he said next I found more astonishing, and, and that's something you have to remember. He's worried about Russia, who he describes as an aggressor state. He doesn't want Britain leaving the EU, meaning that somehow Russia is able to continue being so aggressive as it has been to his country. Now that's a critical point for tonight, and I want you to remember that if you can. And then finally, um, a couple more. We couldn't really mention Euro without mentioning Greece because they hit the headlines a lot. Alexis Sparis said, Brexit will either be a wake-up call or the beginning of a dangerous path. And it confirms the deep political and identity crisis of the EU. Now, it's not surprising that he said that because he's trying to run a country which has massive um, austerity sanctions on it. So he's probably not going to be a huge fan of the EU anyway. Um, but finally, we also had Shinzo Abe, um, and he said we're very concerned over the risks to the global economy, financial and exchange markets. Quite a lot. The point I want to make is that these are all world leaders. They are not newspaper boffins. They're not trying to sell newspapers or get headlines. Well, not all of them. You notice I didn't have Donald Trump because his comment was just so remarkably wrong. He landed, and he went, arrived in Scotland um, and went to the golf course he owned and, and literally said, tweeted and said, it's great to see the Scottish people have got what they wanted. And all the Scots went, no, we haven't. So it was quite bizarre. So he didn't make my list. But anyway, they, these are world leaders. They're supposed to be cool, calm and collect. And I think what we just saw is they're not. They're all very worried. They're worried in the face of this crisis. So that's what they were said, but what actually happened? Well, I'm sure you know this. The pound got pounded. It fell to a 31-year low. Um, so that's back in pretty much 1985 when I was born. Um, and of course, global markets dived as a result. Um, and I actually discovered only recently, the level to which they dived was steeper than when Lehman Brothers collapsed, which was what um, heralded the, the GFC back in 2008. So they fell even steeper than just before the GFC. Some of them have recovered somewhat, but there's a lot of uncertainty around there. And the view in Europe, I thought, was quite nicely summed up by these cartoons I found. Um, I've watched that one on loop a lot, and I don't get sick of it. It's pretty funny. But that, I think that's how the rest of Europe thinks about um, what, what Britain has done to do, chosen to do. So, okay, I'm going to have to change that, I'm only going to pay attention. So, I'm just, it's not our intent to talk really any longer about Brexit than that. I thought I'd just run through a few other implications. Um, there's going to be job losses. So immediately after the vote came out, a number of companies like HSBC um, and another one starting with M, whose name I've forgotten, um, they immediately said, look, we're going to have to move staff to Paris because we just can't operate where we're outside of the EU. Um, but an early estimates reported around 950,000 job losses. Now that's almost a million jobs. That's a lot of people, a lot of families, a lot of mortgages. It's going to cause all sorts of trouble. Now there's political contagion because um, a lot of other um, EU nations, or at least parties, right-wing parties in other EU nations, they want out as well. So there's a, a Dutch politician who's the Dutch version of Nigel Farage, and he immediately said, this is brilliant, ne let's get the Netherlands out of the EU, and then Italy did the same thing, and, and Greece wants out because they're not very happy about not having any pocket money anymore. So political contagion is a big problem. There's immigration. How do you just shut your borders? What do you do with all the immigrants who are already inside your borders? What do you do with the immigrants that are married to citizens of the country? There's a whole raft of issues to think about with immigration. There's also the fear of a recession. The Financial Times got a hundred economists together and they said to them, what, do you think, what impact do you think this is going to have? And three quarters of them said it would adversely impact the UK's um, prospects and it said it would have far-reaching and damaging consequences for London's financial sector. And lastly, it caused huge leadership hemorrhage. So 20 Labour MPs resigned because they, they took a very weak stance on the whole position. Um, Boris Johnson resigned, but he's got a new job. Nigel Farage resigned, but he was always planning on it. Uh, a lady called Andrea Leadsom, who you might have heard more of, she was challenging to be the PM. She also stepped down. So in short, what happens next? 
well, and see my image is already old. Now, David Cameron doesn't really care what happens next because he's gone home to tea and biscuits. But Theresa May now has a whole lot of uncertainty to face. The new British PM has all sorts of issues. And part of the problem is that Article 50, which is kind of the exit route out of the EU, I think it's only been around since 2007 and it's never ever been triggered. So no one has any idea how to do this. No one has any idea how to extricate themselves and the global financial markets don't like uncertainty. So that's a lot. We're going to finish with Brexit. Put your hand up if you're still with me. Still, yep, most hands. Great, still here. Okay, well we could spend all night just talking about Brexit because that's a very, very rude summary of it. Um, but the point is that many Bible students, unlike the world at large, were not surprised about Brexit at all. In fact, we were, you could say we were expecting it. I personally was surprised that it happened so soon, but I wasn't surprised that it happened. And we're going to talk about why. And this is where the Bible comes into it. Now, before we can get our teeth stuck into the Bible, I want to establish a few um, important points. The Bible is a book of prophecy. So over one third of the Bible is made up of prophecy. So it's a very important part. And what that means is, is that God, through the Bible, is revealing his plan and purpose with the earth to people who, who take the time and the energy to read and understand it. So that when these things happen, we're not surprised, we can understand what's happening. Now I'm going to give you just three very quick examples of past Bible prophecies. I'm literally going to fly past these because each one is the topic of, of a public lecture or a talk in itself. The first one is the fall of ancient Babylon. This is prophesied in a number of different places in the Bible. And the, the middle quote, uh, sorry, the top quote of Isaiah 45 is really interesting because it actually, um, it actually tells you exactly how the city was going to fall um, and that it would involve the diverting of a river. Now there's a person in the hall called Luke McClure who knows a lot about this topic, so if you want to know more about that, I'll point him out at the end. He's done a great talk on it. But, so the fall of ancient Babylon was, was prophesied in the Bible, um, as was the rise and fall of consecutive world empires. And this is really quite astonishing because it's a dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. He was the king of Babylon. And it goes through all the major world empires that would follow after him right up to the present day. And, and the level of detail in that dream and in that chapter is just astonishing. And when you look at the huge breadth of time that it spans up until today, it's impossible that it could have been written after the event because it's still going on now. So it's really quite an amazing prophecy. But those are very ancient what about something in our own time? Well, the return of Israel um, to their own land, um, not to mention their actual survival, is quite an amazing testament of Bible prophecy. And the middle quote, Isaiah 53, is where God says, Israel are my witnesses. As long as they're alive, you know I exist. Now, I don't know if you saw the news, but the other day there was an article about the Philistines. They've just, archaeologists have just uncovered some stuff about the Philistines, and they said, this is amazing. We haven't known much about them forever, and now we've managed to dig up this dusty hole and find stuff out about the Philistines. Well, they were the old antagonists of Israel. So it's just a further reminder that all of those old empires of ages past who tried and failed to overthrow Israel are confined to dust, and yet somehow Israel go on today and they're back in their own land. So that's a fascinating prophecy as well. So all we wanted to prove is that the Bible is a book of prophecy. And there's two final facts that we need um, to establish before we go on. The first one is quite a momentous idea, that the Bible prophesies the visible return of Jesus Christ to the earth. Now that is through the entire Bible. Um, and I've only put a few quotes up there on the screen, which unfortunately we don't have time to look up. If you want the slides afterwards, come and give me an email address and I'll happily pass them on. But what's more important than that even, for tonight's talk, is that the Bible explains exactly what will happen, what events will happen in the lead up to his return to the earth. Um, so that followers of Jesus aren't caught unawares by his appearance. And that's why tonight um, is so interesting and, and where we come in. So we're going to have a look at um, a very interesting Bible prophecy, but I do need to make one, clarity, um, one point. Was the EU referendum prophesied in the Bible? And the answer is no, it wasn't. There's nothing in the Bible about this particular referendum, but what there is are its implications. And this is where we're going to dig a little deeper.
So, while I have a drink of water before I am parched, please, if you have a Bible, turn over to Ezekiel 38, and we're going to have a very quick look at this chapter now. Now, this chapter is 23 verses long, so in the interest of time, I'm going to put a, a, a brief summary up on the screen in front of you. And we're going to pull out a few verses um, from, from the story um, for the sake of summary. But what I'll do is I'll give you a quick 30 second rundown of what's happening. This chapter paints a picture of a battle. It's the Battle of Armageddon, which you may have heard of. But what's it really about? Well, what we're going to discover is that this chapter is about a northern confederacy of nations, and they're headed up by Russia, which is why I wanted you to remember what Petro Poroshenko thinks of Russia earlier. They're headed up by Russia, and, and they swoop down and invade Egypt, and then they head back up and they invade Israel. Now, there is an opposing force of sorts who stands up to Russia and says, whoa, what are you doing? What are you doing? Have you come to take a spoil? And they try to, to stand up to this huge northern power. But at that stage, when the battle is joined, the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth and he defeats that army and begins to set up his own kingdom of righteousness and peace, the, the kingdom of God on the earth. Now, in a, in a real quick summary... That's, that's the message of this prophecy. Now, for someone not familiar with the Bible, I'm sure if you cast your eyes down um, through the chapter, there's a lot of names there that aren't familiar, um, and there's a lot of language that might seem unfamiliar as well. So we're going to work through by asking three key questions. What, when, and who? And hopefully we can answer that now. So what is this chapter all about? Well, this chapter is quite clearly about a conflict um, and we see that from a number of verses, but let, let me read with you from verse um, 2 to 5. Son of man, that's Ezekiel, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I'll turn thee back, and I will put hooks in thy jaws. You need to remember that phrase. I'll put hooks in thy jaws and I'll bring thee forth all thine army, horses and horsemen, clothed with great armour, even a great company, Persia, Ethiopia, Libya with them, all with shield and helmet, Goma and all his bands, the house of Tagama, and many people. So this is a big army. He says, Be thou prepared and prepare for thyself. Verse 8, after many days you shall be visited, and the latter days you shall come into the land that is brought back from the sword, against the mountains of Israel. Verse 9, you shall ascend and come like a storm, and you shall be like a cloud to cover the land, you and all your bands or armies and many people with you. And in verse 11 and 12 and so on, it goes on to say, that they, they have this evil thought and they think, right, I'm going to go up and I'm going to take Israel and I'm going to take a spoil. So that, that's the, the real powerful opening of this chapter. So what? It's a battle. It's a big battle. Well, what about when? Well, we actually read when as we work through. It said, verse 8, after many days, or in the last days, it says a bit later on, in the latter years. Now, what's interesting is what we find out is that it's not only is it in the latter years, or the last days before Jesus returns, but it is when Israel are back in their land. Now that means it could not have happened before 1948. Because Israel had not been in their land ever since AD 70. Just 40 years after Jesus was on the earth, the Romans overthrew Jerusalem, and the Jews were scattered. And they only really returned to the land in 1948, and they only got control of Jerusalem back in 1967. So this battle can't have happened before then. And I'm pretty sure if you look in your history books, you'll find it hasn't happened yet. So that's the when, and it also gives us the where. This is obviously a northern power, and it's going to happen in Israel. And finally, who? Well, what we'll discover is that there's three key players. There's an invading force, there's an opposing nation, and then there's the countries in the middle who are actually invaded. And what we're going to do is, is very briefly um, work through these. So I've just done this um, in a nice little simple map. Um, it's not that flash, but hopefully it gives you the picture. So what it says is that the invading force is from the far north. 
um, which is verse 15 of the chapter. You shall come from th thy place out of the north parts, you and many people with you riding upon horses, a great army. Um, and what we also find is that there's a parallel prophecy in a book called Daniel chapter 11, and there this um, invading force is called the king of the north. So he very clearly comes from, from the far north, or the uttermost part of the north, as another translation of the Bible says. Now he's got a number of, of friends with him, he's not just on his own. Um, and you can see on the screen here there's a few different names. So some of them we recognise, like Persia, um, which was obviously Iran, Libya, Ethiopia, and so on. But there's also Goma and Magog, which we'll touch on in a moment. So that's the invading force, someone from the far north of Israel. Well, the opposing forces are these curious people in verse 13. And, and these are the guys who say, hang on a minute, what do you think you're doing? And verse 13 says, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, say, have you come to take a spoil? Now, we'll touch on them in a moment. And finally, there's the invaded countries, which is Israel, and we're told that in this chapter. And in Daniel 11, we're told that Egypt also gets invaded. So Israel and Egypt are the invaded. So let's, let's look a little bit more at who this, um, this invading force actually is. Now, the, obviously, uh, if you're not aware, the, the Bible, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And the original translation of this <coughs> chapter says the invading force from the north is called Gog, Prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Now, Rosh is an ancient word that can mean prince or head, and I believe it was actually used in ancient <coughs> Russia as well, which isn't surprising given the, given the sound of the word. Um, in like manner, Meshach and Tubal, if, if we had time to do some pretty in-depth research, we'd discover that they correspond <coughs> to ancient parts of Russia. It's pretty interesting, at least on the surface, that we have Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and we have Russia, Moscow, and Tobolsk, which was the ancient capital of Siberia, which forms a huge part of the Russian landmass. So Bible students also believe that this is not just about Russia. Europe is also closely aligned with this Russian power. And we'll see some really interesting news articles about this in a moment. Because if we, if we had time to study the ancient names of Magog and Goma, I think we'd find that, um, that they relate to Europe as they're shown on the map. But Bible students, probably won't be surprised if in the coming days, weeks and months we see Europe and Russia starting to draw closer together because that's, that's precisely what I believe we're being told in Ezekiel 38. So the Bible predicts that immediately before the return of Christ this militarily strong and aggressive, to use Petro Poroshenko's words, this aggressive Russian empire, European Russian alliance, is going to come south and it's going to invade Israel. And Daniel 11 says he'll invade Israel with a huge army and with many ships. Now, if you're interested, you can jump on, not now, but you can jump on your phone and just Google Putin's navy. He's actually just made the news recently because he sacked half of his commanders. He's, he's doing a purge of it. But Putin has a huge, enormous navy. Um, and that's something worth looking into in your own time. But this is where I think things get really interesting for our own time. Things we're actually seeing on the internet, on TV, in the newspapers. Because the Bible gives us the reason why this Russian-European alliance comes down um, to invade. It says that they've come to take a spoil. And we're going to um, give you perhaps two suggestions as to what this might be. The first suggestion is from Ezekiel 38 verse 4. God says, I will turn you around and put hooks in your jaws and pull you down. Now that's a really interesting phrase. Because it's interesting that the, the hooks in the jaw was um, an invention used by the Assyrians. Um, it was kind of like having your ankle shackled, except far more effective. Because they get a hook and they put it in under the fleshy part just under your neck. Um, I see some people doing this, I don't blame you. So they put it in under there and then they chain you along like that. You don't really try to bolt out of the chain line if you're attached by a hook to your jaw. So that's, that's a, a pretty effective way of keeping people in line. Now, that's a practice invented by the Assyrians. And in our own time today, we have a very Assyrian-like force that has arisen in the Middle East. In fact, they actually operate out of Mosul, which is one of the ancient Assyrian capitals. And they use many of the same barbaric practices that the Assyrians are famous for, like crucifixion, or public stonings, or public beheadings. 
And I found it particularly interesting, without being dogmatic, that ISIS has already drawn Russia down into the Middle East. To a certain extent, they've already put a hook in the Russian jaw and pulled them down. And they did that the minute they started targeting Russian airliners and Russian military targets and Russian tourist resorts even in Turkey. That the minute they started doing that, they, they drew, um, drew Russia down into the Middle East. And I wonder if the continuing threat of ISIS is going to eventually act as a hook to pull them down. Because Russia's already come out and said, we need to protect Christianity. We need to protect Russian Christians and we need to protect them from ISIS. So I don't think we've seen the last of the Russian ISIS um, confrontation. But here's another reason why it, it, it possibly might happen. Aren't they come to take a spoil? Now, what on earth would Russia want from Israel and Egypt? Well, if you know anything about the Russian economy, you'd know that they're big on one particular thing. And that one particular thing is gas. Because hopefully what you can see from that map is that Russia are the critical supplier of gas to Europe. They, um, you, unfortunately, you probably can't see all the names, but all the um, countries in dark, um, whatever that is, dark red, I suppose, over 75% of their imports of gas come from Russia. And one of those, of course, is the Ukraine, um, which partly explains why Russia is, is so interested in Ukraine, because I think, I think it's 40, oh, not 40, sorry, um, 80%, something like that, of all their um, pipelines into Europe actually go through Ukraine. So Russia has a vested interest in that country. But they, they are big on gas. Europe needs Russia. More than once, Russia's threatened to basically turn the tap off and, and leave Europe frozen, um, or certain countries in Europe at least, frozen through winter. But in the same sense, Russia needs Europe. They're one of their biggest customers. So what on earth might bring Russia down into Egypt and Israel? Well, here's three things you might find interesting. In January 2009, the Mediterranean's largest natural gas field was discovered off, off the coast of Haifa um, in Israeli waters, and it was said to contain 200 billion cubic metres of gas. Now, that's called the Tamar gas field, and it was the largest gas field discovered in the region until the next year, when they discovered what they called the Leviathan gas field, also in the same area, also in Israeli waters. Now, the, um, the Tamar field was 200, did I say billion? I did, 200 billion cubic meters. The Leviathan is 450 um, billion cubic uh, meters of gas. And one news article said, this is an opportunity for Israel to become a major energy player in the Middle East. So that remained the largest ever gas find, natural gas find in the Mediterranean until August 2015 when an Italian company discovered the new largest ever natural gas find in the Mediterranean which is called the Zor gas field. Now that contains 850 billion cubic metres of gas. Now if you haven't been able to keep up, that means that the Zor field is four times as big as Tamar and almost double the size of the Leviathan. Now I think that's fascinating. You can't be dogmatic about it, but Russia wants to control gas. Russia wants to control gas into Europe because it's a key player for them. And now we have these two nations in the Middle East, right on the border of Europe, who suddenly have their own massive gas supply. Isn't that fascinating? Of the top 10 largest natural gas fields, Russia controls five, and they absolutely depend on um, gas exports. So Israel and Egypt, um, the two nations who happen to be invaded by Russia in Ezekiel 38 now um, are potentially a, a new threat to them. So in summary then, hopefully you can see that the Bible predicts the rise of this, this northern power and their eventual invasion of the Middle East. Now, we're going to have a quick look at verse 13 again because that explains what on earth any of this has to do with Brexit. Because I, I know you're probably confused as to why we're almost at the end of the class and we haven't really mentioned Britain yet. Because it's there in verse 13 that Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, they, they put up a bit of a verbal fight. Now, to be honest, it's a bit feeble. It's a bit like when the UN feebly protested when Russia annexed Crimea in 2015. Um, now, that's actually a, a, an image of Syria, but um, I'm sure if I had the time, I could have found one of Crimea as well, because Russia basically marched in and took Crimea, and there was a lot of verbal condemnation from the UN, 
uh, but not a lot apart from a few sanctions which Russia have written out. Now Sheba and Dedan are named in this opposing force. And if we had more time, we'd find out that these nations correspond to some nations in the Gulf um, states today. So Sheba was ancient Seba, which are the Sabaeans, and they settled in what we know as modern-day Yemen. Um, and Dida were the Dedanites who settled in Saudi Arabia. Now it's interesting that both Yemen and Saudi Arabia have a strong US military presence today. And of course we know the US are, 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 have been talking up their relationship with Britain recently. But it's the mysterious Tarshish that we want to point our attention to as, as we draw this to a close. Who's Tarshish and what on earth does it have to do with Britain leaving the EU? Now if you haven't guessed by now, many Bible students believe that Tarshish corresponds to Britain. And that raises an important question. If Tarshish is Britain, why doesn't the Bible just say that? Why doesn't it just say it's Britain and make it all easy for us? And the answer is quite simple. Because back in AD, uh, sorry, back in BC 600, um, 600 years before Christ, when Ezekiel was prophesying, Britain didn't exist by name. And neither did Russia, or Germany, or France, or, or many others. So rather than use names, which often change, the Bible uses special identifying characteristics. So for example, for Russia, it says a great northern, aggressive, militarily strong power. Those are the characteristics we're given. And in fact, what we find is that it does the same thing for Tarshish. And I'm going to go through these reasonably quickly because we're only going to explain a couple. But what it says is that whoever Tarshish is, they inherit the spirit of Tyre, this merchant city of Tyre, which was very famous. So Tarshish is going to be a merchant or a trading nation. They're going to be of Japhetic or European origin. Um, and that's, that's harking back to um, a passage in Genesis. Um, Japheth was one of the sons of Noah who, who eventually settled in Europe. They're going to be rich in metals, both precious and non-precious, and we'll talk about that in a second. They're a major maritime power, says Isaiah. They actively trade in global markets, says Ezekiel in two different places. And the fact that they're a maritime power isn't surprising because Isaiah tells us that they're an island power as well. They're also to the far west of Israel, um, Jonah tells us. And finally, we learn that they are going to be a God-fearing nation. Now, we don't have time to go through all of these in, in too much depth, so let's pick on just four. Merchants and trading markets. So Britain has long been a merchant power, and I think that's evidenced by the huge spread of their empire um, as they established colonies and trading posts around the world. And, and even the fact today, London is, is indisputably, at least for now, um, the trading centre of the world. It's, it's the centre of the financial trading hub of Europe and, and certainly the world. I don't think Shanghai or Hong Kong are quite there yet. What about a major maritime power? Well, I think this is another clear point to Britain because as an island power, they've had a navy who has ruled the waves. As the popular refrain goes, rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves. And that often reminds us of the fact. So the Royal Navy was actually um, founded in 1660, and in the 17th and 18th centuries they vied with the French and the Dutch for supremacy. And from about the middle of the 18th century, they became the world's premier navy. And they stayed that way right up until the end of World War II, when they were overtaken by their ally, the US. But it's, it's clearly um, well known that they, they have always been a very strong maritime power. Now, they're quite clearly an island nation, um, and they're also to the far west of Israel, so we probably don't need to explain that one too much. But this is probably my favourite. They're rich in silver, iron, tin and lead. Now, you may not know this, but Britain was a key producer of, of metals in ancient times. So, especially in Devon and Cornwall, they mined metals there from 2150 BC, right up until 1998 when the last mine was closed. And when I was researching this, um, I actually found a news article which said Cornwall wants to open their mines again. So um, perhaps some people think they've still got precious metals there. But even if they don't have those mines in operation, even today, Britain, and particularly London, is the centre of precious and non-precious metals. And here's a few stats. The London Metal Exchange um, is the world centre for trading industrial metals. More than 80% of all non-ferrous or non-iron metals, so that's aluminium, copper and brass, 
more than 80% passed through the, um, the London Metal Exchange. So that's, in 2015, that was $12 trillion or 4 billion tonnes. Now there's also the London Bullion Exchange, which trades in gold and silver, and there's the London Platinum Market as well. So if you want precious metals or you want normal metals, Britain's your place, particularly London. And I thought that was quite fascinating. But there's one thing I've left off. You'll notice in verse 13 it says, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions thereof. And you won't be surprised to know that throughout, throughout history, Britain has referred to himself as the old lion and his colonies as the young lion. There's a couple of posters, one of which is from um, World War II, uh, World War I rather. In case you can't read it, it says the empire needs men, the overseas states, that are the young lions, all answer the call. Helped by the young lions, the old lion defeats his foes. And it doesn't matter where you look, even if you look at the, um, the, the in fact, they're quite hard to spot at the moment because they're all in hiding. But the English football team is known as the three lions as well. So it doesn't really matter where you look. The English cricket board has, the ECB has three lions um, on there. I think it's three. Um, so everywhere you look, this idea of a lion is, is closely affiliated with um, Britain. And finally, there's another prophecy that says, after the return of Christ, and when the Russian-European alliance is defeated, well, Tarshish actually is still around, and so are Sheba and Dedan, because they actually help bring the um, Israelites back to their land. And that's in Isaiah 60, verse 11. We're almost there. So what does that mean? Well, put simply, it means that Britain cannot be on both sides of, the, of this coming conflict. If, in fact, as the Bible says, Russia and Europe are going to um, create this alliance and come down into the Middle East, Britain is not on their side. She stands apart and actually attempts to oppose them and ends up surviving the conflict when Russia and, and Europe are defeated by the Lord Jesus Christ and his armies, which is another um, issue we haven't been able to get our teeth stuck into. So that, in a nutshell, is why that many of us weren't surprised that the referendum happened. I've been a bit curious to see if it would actually go through. I wondered if they'd try and backflip. I personally thought that even if they didn't invoke Article 50, which they haven't yet, I think the damage in the relationship has been done. Even if they decide not to exit um, the EU right at this present time, which seems extraordinarily rare, the damage in the relationship has been done and the divorce has begun. Now, there's one final thought about why many um, many Bible students, and in fact many religious observers, thought that Britain and the EU may never be a particularly long and happy marriage. And this is why. Because the man on the screen is Henry VIII, and he's well known for starting the Church of England. Now let me look, I'll show you a few statistics. Almost 40% of Europe identifies as Roman Catholic. 8% of the United Kingdom can say the same. 19 of the of the top 50 most Catholic countries are from Europe and the UK is number 101 on the list. So they've got quite diverse religious backgrounds as well, religious histories. And, and what I think um, is interesting is that I think with Protestant Britain, i.e. Britain that isn't predominantly Catholic, as they move away from Europe, the Pope is going to look at Europe and say, I have a much clearer path now to spread my influence. And it wouldn't be surprising to see um, the religious spread of the Roman Catholic Church through Russia and Europe. That's something else that's prophesied in the Bible, which we simply haven't had time to touch on tonight. But let me show you this momentous photograph. Because in February 2016, our world witnessed the first meeting of the eastern part of the Catholic Church, the Russian Orthodox, and the western part of the Catholic Church, the Pope. It's the first meeting since 1054. That's almost a thousand years. That's how long these two have been separate because of a whole range of differences going back to 1054. And what we saw is that they met in Cuba, they embraced and they held some talks, and it was really quite amazing that we began to see closer relationships, religiously speaking, between Europe and Russia, just as we'd expect. Now let me give you one final thought. What do you think Putin thinks of Brexit? Well, this photo wasn't necessarily taken the moment that Brexit happened, but I wouldn't be surprised if something like that happened. And here's why. CNN said, does Brexit leave the Kremlin smiling? 
Another one said, Russia revels in the Brexit vote. Now this is interesting. Washington fears that Brexit will unravel its anti-Russia policy. And while I have a drink, I'm going to let you ponder the last one. That stunned silence. Ru um, Brexit could open the door to Russia joining the EU. I was quite amazed when I saw that headline. Given everything we've discussed about this Russian-European alliance and their eventual move into the Middle East. Well, I think that's probably enough for tonight. Let's close by considering the current state of the world. And you may remember that earlier I said that students of the Bible are very excited by what we've seen. We're excited about what's happening, but that seems a very unusual thing to say because we've spent a lot of tonight talking about a time of coming trouble. So why on earth are we excited? Well, no true worshipper of God or follower of Jesus Christ should rejoice in anyone else's sufferings, and we don't. That's not what we're about. There's only one reason we're excited, and that's because we believe these events herald the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. In absolutely no way are any of us happy that innocent, hard-working people, particularly in the UK, are going to suffer. It could be a tragedy. This vote, this move to exit the EU, as we mentioned earlier, and as all the world leaders seem to imply, this could signal years of hardship and recession. There will be financial uncertainty. There will be jobs lost. There will be family suffering. There will be people fearing for their futures. There will be countries worried about war, which is exactly what some of them have picked up on. They've said the EU is the only thing that has stood between us and another world war. And now that's, that's, that's on the threat of breaking up, as you saw the world leaders. So everyone's worried. But again, for the Bible student, these things are expected. Because Jesus Christ foretold these things himself. He said there would be distress of nations, per, um, perplexity, men's hearts failing them for fear. The powers of heaven, which is a, a biblical phrase for people in positions of height, of rulership. Um, he said the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Now, if you've read many headlines about Brexit, you'll know that a number of political commentators unusually chose to call it an earthquake. A political earthquake, they said, which was really quite amazing. And what Jesus says is, when you see those things happen, then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with um, power and great glory. And when these things become to become, begin to come to pass, look up, your redemption draws nigh. So the question is, where will the solution come from? And the answer is that everywhere we look, we see a world collapsing under the weight of its own problems. We have problems that... If you sensibly look at history, you would realise man does not have the capacity to solve these problems. He doesn't have the willpower, he doesn't have the true desire. In our own time, we are witnesses of global climate change. This is in our own time, today, what we have seen. Global climate change, widespread civil war, poverty, disease, terrorism, inequality, violence and mountains of unsolvable government debt that just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. More and more money controlled by less and less people. And you have to be honest, you have to ask yourself a hard question. Which political party is honestly going to solve that problem? You don't have to look far to Australian politics to see that the parties swap over every couple of years, but the results are always the same. Who's really going to solve those problems? On a, on a global scale, are Trump or Clinton going to somehow solve America's debt crisis? Can Merkel protect Europe from Islamic terrorism? Can Putin somehow save Syria and stop the migrant crisis? The reality is that these problems aren't going to go away quickly. And for us, for Bible students, we can take a lot of comfort because for thousands of years, the Bible has been slowly but surely predicting global events with quite astonishing accuracy. There's only one man who can provide the vision and the execution and the answers to a planet that badly needs them. And, and his plan, the Lord Jesus Christ, is outlined in Psalm 72. And I urge you to go away and read that chapter yourself. Now, despite everything we've said tonight, we don't know when the Lord Jesus Christ will return to the earth. It could be seven days' time. It could be seven weeks. It could be seven more years. But we know that it's coming. He himself said, of that day and hour knows no man. But from what we've seen 
at least tonight I hope, from Bible prophecy and from Ezekiel 38. It could be just moments away because the nations really are moving into place just as the Bible predicted they would literally thousands of years ago. And it's quite astonishing. So let's finish with a personal challenge. The challenge for you to take home. The visible, actual, physical return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth is coming. And this is taught consistently throughout the Bible. It's not true, despite modern church teaching, that the kingdom of God is just confined to heaven. And, and I, there are some quotes from earlier on in the presentation you can look up if you're interested. As we mentioned, Psalm 72 provides a clear snapshot of what his reign will look like and how he will begin to transform the earth. And so the challenge is to take the time to go home and open the Bible for yourself and to read it for yourself. Don't just believe what someone else tells you. Don't just believe what I've said tonight. Open it up and read it for yourself. Read it carefully with an open mind. Read it for what it says to you, not what modern churches want you to believe it says. Why? Because what you'll discover is that all of us have been invited to play a part in the Bible's greatest prophecy, which is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth and the setup of his eternal kingdom. There is coming global turmoil, and the Bible has the only plausible solution. Thank you.